You know, they, they call it church here, the church militant. You like that word, militant? And I know the Christian life can be described as other things, but the fact that we are in warfare is a reality. We're to gird ourselves with the armor of God. We know that the church, and the church isn't just supposed to stand in doing all to stand. We actually have been told that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's, it's not just a stagnation and a standing still. There is a sense in which the church is to advance. We, don't we have something to conquer? I mean, haven't we been put here and left here for a purpose? And so that, this is where my message stems from today. And so I hope you'll let me talk about giants. Will you let me talk about giants here? <clears throat> so we know that, it, here's what I find interesting. Whatever was written in times past has been written for our instruction. Whatever. So that tells me that my Old Testament is really valuable to me. But you know what's really impressive is that out of those kind of statements, you know what it's made there in Romans, it's kind of general, whatever. But when you go to 1 Corinthians, it's like there is one thing that the apostle specifically calls out as being for our instruction. And you know what it is? It's the Hebrew children in the wilderness. You ever notice that? It, listen to this. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. I get. Did you get that? The rock was Christ. Isn't that interesting? The apostle goes back there, and for our instruction, this account has been recorded about Israel in the wilderness for our instruction, Christ was there. Christ was that rock. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things, those specific things with regards to those fathers who were there with Moses, out there in the wilderness, these things took place as examples for us. And we know. We know what it is that they're being called out for. It says it again. In verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, don't turn there, just listen to this. Now, these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And what's the purpose they were recorded? Well, it's pretty plain. We must not put Christ to the... There he is again. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed. Isn't that interesting? He keeps calling out that Christ was back there. And these things are for our instruction on whom the ends of the world, the ends of the ages have come. And, and this, we must not put Christ to the test. You know what? Paul uses the same kind of language used back in Numbers where it says this, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice. And how did they not obey his voice? Well, there's numerous things, but one of the main ones is they didn't go up and take the land when God told them to go take the land. So, that's where I want to go. All of this is for our instruction. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at it for our instruction. So I want to mainly key in on Numbers 13 and 14. So if you'll turn back there in your Bibles, Numbers 13. One of the brothers just told me recently that he was in his, in his Bible reading, he came to the book of Numbers and he was discouraged. You get that way sometimes when you're reading through the Scripture. Yeah, I get to certain books, and you feel like, oh, no, not, not, not these genealogies again. And he said, but Numbers actually has some really, really 
profitable things, some really good things. So here we are. 13.1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men. Now this is for our instruction, and I'm going to call out a few things that I just want you to take real notice of. The, the first thing is here in verse 2. God spoke, and he sends these men to spy out the land. Now notice this, the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. Now we could find that in a lot of places. He promised the land to Abraham. There's numerous places where God says, I promise this, I give this. But here it is right here at the beginning. Right before the spies are sent out, God has already said, I'm giving this land to the people. So, so there's a promise here that's the backdrop to everything that happens. And I think, well, listen, when this is for our instruction, I think one of the things we have to remember is what has God promised us? So let's keep reading. Verse 17, 13, 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go and see what the land is. Now, you know, what's, it, what's really interesting about this is they could have taken the land without sending spies in, but God specifically said, send the spies in. Why? They weren't needed. They weren't necessary. Well, actually, they were necessary. Not necessary to taking the land, but it's, it's a necessary part of all this. It was really important that they go in and see what kind of enemy they were up against. It plays a part in the story. See what the land is. Specifically, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they dwell in are camps, you, you see what that is. Are they living in tents, all exposed, or are they behind fortified walls? That's the idea. Verse 20, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees or not. But in the midst of all this, be of good courage. Of course you should be of good courage. Why? Because God already promised, I'm giving you the land. Of course they should be of good courage. Bring some of the fruit of the land. Verse 21, so they went up, they spied out the land, they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Now, don't you love this? They came to Hebron. We know this place. This is going to be the place where Caleb is going to end up dwelling. But of course, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai live there. Well, who are these guys? Descendants of Anak. So, what is, what is that? And then, you, and then you get this. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. I have no idea why that's there, other than maybe just a footnote that it's an ancient, Hebron is ancient. It's old. Maybe it was there from not too long after the flood. They came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. Verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. They came to Moses and Aaron and to the congregation of the people of Israel. And they brought back to them and to all the congregation, showed the fruit of the land. And they, verse 27, they told him, we came to the land, they told Moses, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. Of course it flows with milk and honey. God said he was going to give them a land that flows with milk and honey. That's exactly what they should have found there. Verse 28. However. Now, I don't know how that resonates with you. Maybe your Bible says, nevertheless or notwithstanding. Does anybody get provoked by that? word do you hear that in the church well yes we know god told us this and we should do this and they, there's these promises and we see that the church did this and historically with it however i hope somebody can get upset it seems uh, brethren i just it feels to me like many professed christians they just accept doubting and fearing it's almost just a necessary state of believers however however I mean, has faith left the field? 
They're the champions. I mean, it's like sinful sight carries the day. It's such a time when, when the, 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 faith ought to carry the day and the doubters be put to shame. Look what's happening here. The, the unbelief is always so full of these doubtful howevers. Exceptions. Why we can't do this. Why we can't do that. Friends, the, the, the fact is that the church doesn't have any need of greater numbers and greater size and more machinery to usurp faith. Brethren, I hope somebody can just get stirred up about howevers. I feel that in my own soul. Okay, 1328. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. I mean, not only are these guys giants, you got the descendants of Anak there. The people are strong. The cities are fortified. They're very large. I mean, this whole thing is intimidating. And besides, it's like these guys are saying to add insult to injury, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalekites, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Canaanites. Verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we're well able to overcome it. 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out, a land that devours its inhabitants. You want to remember that. And all the people we saw in it are of great height. We saw the Nephilim. <laughs> this, is, this is the one place in Scripture where it attaches Nephilim with the sons of Anak. And they come from the Nephilim. So this group that's called out all the way back in Genesis is, is connected, these giants. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. That's the name of my, my sermon, the grasshopper complex. Or a word about giants. And notice this. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And I don't know about you, but this last part jumped out at me. And so we seemed to them. Isn't that interesting that they would put that in there? How did they know that? That's what I asked myself. Like, did they sit down and have coffee with these sons of Anak and say, what do you guys think of us? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys are grasshoppers. I mean, how do they know that it's understandable to say we felt like grasshoppers in their presence, but to actually say, and so we appeared to them. Well, how did they even know that? Unless they were dialoguing with these giants. Which, I mean, they very well might have been. How else would they know that? So, grasshopper complex. Now we know the rest of the story. We know how this thing evolves. That basically the, the, the people were grumbling. Weren't these people always grumbling? Grumbling is just such a picture of unbelief. God was angry with their grumbling. So the grumbling takes place here. And then... Well, we, what we had died in the wilderness. We need to pack up and go back to Egypt. And like always, Moses and Aaron, they fall on their faces. And that's what's happening here. And that's where we pick up. In now Numbers 14, verse 6. Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who spied out the land, they tore their clothes. They said, the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us into the land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. For they are bread for us. Notice that. Their protection is removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them. And this is where God shows up. The glory of the Lord appeared. Verse 11, the Lord said, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? Truly as I live, as the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who had seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt 
and in the wilderness. It have put me to the test these ten times, have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. If you go to 1428, Say to them as I live, declares the Lord, what you've said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness. Verse 30, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. You go to 1436. The men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. The men who brought up a bad report of the land died by the plague before the Lord. Now think about it. I mean, think about the picture. This is, this is historical. This situation happened, and it's an example for us. It's for our instruction. We are to be learning from this. Think about it. In the midst of all this panic, the congregation had suddenly, Caleb, like a great warrior, Caleb stands up in the midst of this. No hesitation. He says, let's go for it. We can do this. I mean, this is given to us. These guys are bred for us. Be eaten. The sw- this land swallows up people. Are you guys crazy? God is with us. We're, gonna, we're the ones that are going to do the eating. They're bred for us. We can go in there. The other ten say, man, we'll be eaten alive. The Anakim, the Anakim. We're going to be eaten by the Anakim. Those, don't you realize there's giants in there? Caleb har- hardly hears it. Let's go in there at once. Let's go right now. It's a great land. Are there giants in there? Sure. Fortified cities? Of course. Brethren, what else do you think God's going to do when he means to put his glory on display? What do you want to be in there? A bunch of old pygmy women with diseased feet? I mean, but seriously, what, are, what, what should be in there when God is with his people and wanting to, to work through them, empower through them? This is the, the, where's God's glory in that? And brethren, the thing is, we're not dealing with a fairy tale here. There's giants. I mean, do you think about that? There's giants. God wants us to know about giants. Why? For our instruction, it's recorded. Listen to this. God wants us to know this. In Hebron, there was a Hyman, Sheshai, Talmai, The descendants of Anak were there. 1333, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. Now I just got thinking, giants, they capture our imagination. What do you know about giants? Jack and the Beanstalk, is that, do you know that here? Jack the Giant Slayer. I mean, where to think about giants. Giant despair. Bunyan had his giants. Tolkien had his giants. C.S. Lewis had his giants. Right? I understand there's giants in Cornwall. You ever heard that? Is that the, is that the lore? I mean, when you go to Celtic mythology, it's got giants. Greek mythology, has got Hindu mythology, Norse mythology. The giants. Sometimes they have one eye, sometimes they had horns in their head. But giants, we th- I mean, they capture the imagination. But the fact is, stepping away from legend, ladies and gentlemen, we have giants in this infallibly inspired, preserved Word of God. They're here. And we, we know some of these guys. Giants exist. What were they called? Well, we got the word Nephilim. We've got the word the, the, the sons of Anak or the Anakim. Heard some of the other words? The Emim, the Zamzumim. You heard these names? And some of these guys are famous. I mean, who's the most famous? They Goliath. They say that he was, however you measure the cubit, the span, 
you know, we got different ideas, but this guy may have very likely been nine foot nine inches tall. Just, I mean, if if you just figure, there's question about what the that measure, and then and then you got what Og, the king of Bashan. What was what was he famous for? His bed. How big was his bed? This thing was like 13 and a half foot long, which gives you some idea about how big he was. And then, you know, do you ever think about the guy that had 24 appendages on his hands and feet? Six fingers on each hand. You remember that guy? You remember what some of their names were? Like Sath, Lame. Have you ever noticed? I mean, some of their names, besides Goliath, some of their names are given to us. These Nephilim, they were on the earth. Listen to this. They were on the earth in those days. These are the days right before the flood. But I find this interesting. And also afterward. Well, that's interesting. That means that the Nephilim were here before the world was wiped out by a flood. And afterward so somehow you have eight souls and then from them somewhere down the line we got more of these giants when the sons of god came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them and all there's different theories about that but these were the mighty men you know the septuagint there says gigantes these are the giants who were of old, the men of renown. <clears throat> What's interesting, isn't it interesting that it's in this context specifically that then we're told about just the imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of men being only evil continuously, and there's all this violence, and God he regrets the fact that he made man. But isn't it interesting that Moses would introduce these Nephilim right in that context? Almost like these guys... Where the, what, do you know what Nephilim means? It comes from the, the word Hebrew, nephal, which means fallen, the fallen ones. And they have different theories. I saw Calvin on this, that some, some feel like it's, it's the idea that they've fallen from the truth. They've fallen from God. They've fallen. They're, they're just epitomes of the fallenness. Others say it had to do with the fact that other men's countenances fell when they saw these guys. Some say that others fell on their faces because of the magnificence. Some say it's like a storm falls upon a land and creates devastation, so these guys fell in that capacity. But basically, the, the fallen ones, the Nephilim. Now, C.S. Lewis describes good giants. The Bible never does. You notice that all the giants in Scripture are enemies to the people of God. You never find a friendly one. Now, no matter what might have happened between the spies and if they were interacting, I mean, the fact is that the Bible knows nothing about that. One of them had a name, Ishbi Banab. You remember that? Another one was called Sipai. Now, look, what we don't want to do is gloss over the references to giants in the Bible. Why? Because giants play an important part in the biblical story, particularly in relationship to the occupation of the promised land. And that's no small thing. Listen, if you think about any piece of property anywhere in this world that is more promised than the land of Canaan, there isn't. I mean, the portion of land most promised throughout Scripture is this promised land. And isn't it absolutely amazing? Remember, it's all recorded for our instruction. Isn't it amazing that the most promised piece of real estate in our Bibles, when the people finally get there to take it, the place is inhabited by giants. Do you know something about that? It's not an accident. Do you know what happened when the Pilgrim Fathers left the old world and went to the new world? Do you know what happened in 1620 when the Mayflower arrived in the new world? Do you know what they were met with? 
disease had wiped out 90% of the native population before they got there. Oh, there was Indian resistance, but not near what it would have been. It's like God cleared the way, but not here. Now when God's, God's given a promise, he's going to give this land, and you better be sure of it, he put giants in the land. And not only did he put giants in the land, he sent the spies in there ahead of time to go see that there's giants in the land and then to go back out and take the report to the people. So let's, let's come down from the Nephilim, the Anakim. Who are these guys? Well, they're descendants of the Nephilim. They're descendants of this man named Anak. We know that there was a father somewhere in there of Anak named Arba because Heb Hebron used to be called Kuriath Arba. And so we know about, we know about this. And, and this Anak had three sons, Ahiman, Sheshai, Talmai. Now, here's what we're told. In Joshua, we're told Joshua cut off the Anakim. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod did some remain. Where was Goliath from? You see who he was related to? You see where he came from? Of course some giants had to be left in Gath. Why? Because David's day was coming, and God had other things to teach, not only David, but it's all done for our instruction. Those giants are left there for a reason, folks. Because you know what? The giants they faced back then have a lot to do with the giants we face today. It's for our instruction. You see, we're supposed to draw parallels out of this. We're supposed to learn from this. Brethren, Moses, 40 years later, you know, Israel has to walk around the wilderness and all their corpses of those 20 years and older, except Caleb and Joshua, they fall dead in the wilderness. After 40 years goes by, Moses now comes to those who are left alive when it's time to go back in there again. And this is what he says. As he readies them to go take the promised land now, he reminds them who is in there. A people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now, in my Bible, my ESV, there are some quotation marks. Listen to this. Listen to how this says. Whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now, that really jumped out at me. Isn't that amazing? It's a proverb. There is a proverb in Israel that Moses takes for granted that all these folks in Israel knew. Who can stand before the sons of Anak? Brethren, that's like in our day saying what? Who, who can beat pancreatic cancer? Well, in a time of recession, who can get a job? We're so small. Who can actually take the gospel to other nations? I mean, you recognize we can get, we can get these proverbial sayings among us that Oh, I wonder how this resonated in the ears of the righteous. A proverb like that. But brethren, there's something awful about that. There's something insulting. Can you imagine this? A people whose God is God Almighty, who is given the kind of promises and who has demonstrated his power over Egypt, for them to actually have a proverb among themselves, I mean, that's the kind of thing that I'm sure if Caleb or Joshua ever heard it, they just spit and they, they were in disgust and they kicked the dirt. Like, how could that be a proverb in Israel? But we can get proverbs like that. Things we say, well, we can't do that. It just becomes so commonplace. It just flows off our tongue. But you know, who can stand before the sons of Anak? It's like Caleb would have said, are you kidding me? Do you ever see that pillow of fire over there? I mean, are, are you guys serious? Oh, I, I can't believe it. 
And then uh, now my next point here is the irrelevance of being grasshoppers. And can you imagine the scene? Ten men pathetically announce the promised land. You know the one that God promised our father Abraham? The one that God said he, he's going to give to us? Well, we're just not eight. We can't do it. We can't go in there. The Anakim, have you not seen these guys? We're going to be swallowed by them. We're going to be eaten up. Can you imagine Caleb and Joshua? I, I can, you can imagine them standing there, and they're looking at these ten. Can you imagine them look at each other in unbelief? They glance over at Moses. Like, what? What is going on here? It's going to create a soul. What? what? What does the comparative strength of giants to us have to do with anything in this? Have you, have you noticed in the church that Christians that trust in a big, big God, they just tend to be baffled by the practical atheism exuded by so many in the church. I mean, brethren, if God told us to go up and take the land, it's absolutely irrelevant if we resemble grasshoppers, if we feel like we're grasshoppers, or if we actually are grasshoppers. What does it matter? It's totally irrelevant. And you know what the beauty of all of it is? God put giants in there on purpose. Why? Because the whole thing, brethren, is about our weakness, but trusting is greatness. Of course, you know what the beauty is? That when we go and take the land and we recognize, yeah, we did look like grasshoppers compared to those guys, but look, we've got the victory. And you know what they did? They put their... Can you imagine? They put their feet on the necks of these guys. They threw rocks over their carcasses. They covered caves over. I mean, you can imagine the dead bodies of these three sons of Anak. And they're standing there. Caleb and Joshua still preserved through all of this time. The, the beauty is that when you get to that point, you look at the size of this guy, and it's like, then you just look up. Because the thing about grasshoppers is grasshoppers can't boast. There's no boasting. It's, it, you know, what grasshopper can boast when God arises and gives the victory? It's like, hadn't God said, I promise that I'll bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, the land of the Canaanites, a land flowing with milk and honey. I promise. So what if the Nephilim are in the way? God's promised. Everything's in God's control. And, it, you know, we can look at providence and we can say, you know, the fact is, He's in control of who's in that land. I mean, you can see he had specific plans. He told Abraham 400 years, sins of the Amorites is not. God's in total control. He had, it's all in his timeline. He puts in there who he wants to. I, I just, you know what I did? I, I just think about, I imagine warfare in Israel. You can imagine this. Isn't it a contest of faith? Because one of the things specifically that God's people were told, you know what, when they went up, they didn't have horses. They didn't have chariots. In fact, they were specifically told, when you see those horses and you see those chariots coming and you see that the masses and the hordes coming against you far outnumber you, do not fear. Oh, can you imagine the roar of chariots? You ever seen some of those that have blades coming off the axles, chop the guy's legs off? Here they come, horses stampeding at you. And God says, don't be. I tell you, out on the battlefield at such a time as that, it tested your faith. It absolutely tested what you believe. You come up against a guy that might be nine foot, nine inches tall. Where are the ones that are going to say, you know what? The paw of the lion, the paw of the bear didn't triumph over me and God gave them to me and you Philistine, you're going to be just like them. There is a God in Israel. There is a God. He is the Lord of hosts and you've defied him. And his confidence was not in his aim. His confidence was in his God. We're the ones who speak like that. I'll tell you, when you see the giant, it tests what you believe about the unseen. Because I'll tell you what, David senses on that day, they saw the mountains, they see, he saw the ridges, he saw the giant, 
He saw his armor. He saw his sword. He saw his sword, his shield bearer. He saw the javelin. He saw the spear. But you know what? His eyes looked past. It was like what Mac was telling us about yesterday. There's a, there's a perceiving. His eyes, his eyes go, I mean, brethren, when you're in a position like that, it tells you what you believe about your God, about his presence, and about his promises. You just think. You just think about combat in those days. You remember, I was, I was thinking back, back when I, I was, I got saved in 1990. So in the 80s, I was lost. I didn't remember going and seeing uh, Indiana Jones and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You remember the scene? Some of you probably. Any of you see that movie? You got a couple hands. Some of you are saying, this guy's pagan. Listen, there is a scene where all of a sudden the crowd parts. And this Arab swordsman steps out. He's just whipping the sword around. Harrison Ford just pulls out his Smith and Wesson. Boom! <laughs> it drops him. So much for, but you know what? You didn't have guns fighting giants. And that day, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, largely. It was your strength and your skill against his. Well, some of the guys, they slung rocks. They had bow and arrow. But I'll tell you, even the bow and arrow, those long bows, you ever seen the long bows that they have here in England? I mean, it took all your might to pull that thing back, and you didn't just sit there like with a compound where it came off release. Easy. Brethren, warfare was tough. You didn't just shoot a guy out there at 200 yards. You imagine what it would be to face a giant. It's like you see him coming at you. It's like, Lord, this guy is scary. This guy has six fingers on each hand. This guy has a javelin that's like a weaver's beam. I mean, I'm feeling pretty grasshopperish right now. But I'll tell you right at that moment, it's going to tell you what you truly believe. And this is for our instruction. Because I'll tell you, there are many scary things that we're faced with even now. We fight the devil, folks. We, we have our Goliaths. The devil is real and the demons are real. And men's hard hearts are real and sin is real. And there are battles to be fought. Folks, giants just exuded strength. You know what it says about Goliath? When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Folks, David took him. Joshua took them out. Caleb. <clears throat> the giants fell. The giants are dead. I mean, one of the things we can glean from this is we just say, brother, sister, if God calls you, if God says, I'm with you, I'll never leave you. Lord, I'm with you to the end of the age. And he sends you to do something ten times harder than your own gift, than your own strength, than your own wisdom can handle. What do we say to that? Go and do it in the strength of the Lord. Don't we read? All things are possible to him who believes. Have you never read that? Brendan, I read that. I have a friend. And he was in the Reformed Baptist circles, affiliated with Al Martin uh, for decades in the U.S. And I heard him, it, he has a, a very firsthand perspective on the Reformed Baptist churches in the United States. And he said this, he said, there is a lack of faith in Reformed Baptist circles he said, not a lack of academic comprehension, but a lack of personal experiential conviction of the power of God. Brethren, what I ask is this, have, you, have we been too quick to say we can't do that? We need to be men like Joshua and Caleb. We can do it. God's with us. We got let many voices. We can't do it. Why? We don't have enough money. We're not big enough. We don't have enough of this. We don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of the other thing. We can't do it. 
Brethren, do you realize this has to do with the glory of God? I just ask you this. Was God a little angry about them not believing and trusting him? Was he just a little angry? Brethren, this is such a reflection on our God. He takes it very personal. You, can, you just can't get away from that. Brethren, none have ever trusted God too much. We want to venture into the realm where we're, we got to have God's help or we're certainly going to be lunch for the giant. Brethren, have we not heard from one of the champions that went as before us attempt great things for God? Watch him work. You know what happens when the church and its leadership loses faith? They dig in for safety. Try to conceal their gains. Oh, brethren, my next point is this. Cowardice is contagious. Just listen to this. In Deuteronomy, where Moses recounts what the people of Israel said when the, skies, when the spies came back, listen to what he said. Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. That's, that's one word, melt. Now, another time in Numbers where Moses recounts the same incident, he says this, when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. You have those two, melt, discourage. And I think about these guys, you kind of wonder, they were in there for 40 days. I guarantee you this, their cowardice didn't just show up when they gave the report in front of Moses. These guys were walking through the land for 40 days. You had Joshua and Caleb over here. They're, they're, they're all observing the same things. What, what happens at that? Can you imagine? You're looking, you're looking through the land. Wow, they're fortified up to heaven. Can you imagine the first time they saw one of the sons of Anak? Folks, we're talking giants. Perhaps close to 10 feet tall? How big do you have to be to have a bed 13 and a half feet? Can you imagine when you see these guys? It's like, what goes through your mind? What goes through, you know what? You know what goes through the mind of the 10? You see the giant, and the first thought is how grasshopperish you are. But you know what? When somebody's got faith, you see the giant. And you just think how big your God is. You see, that's the difference. I have a feeling these guys had conversations. 40 days and 40 nights. There were 40 nights they drifted off to sleep. Having seen what they saw in the day. And you know what? I think two of the guys probably slept pretty soundly. The other 10 guys, maybe not so much. And brethren, the thing is that, that boldness and courage, it doesn't mean that there's no fear. I can imagine these giants look pretty scary. We're often confronted by things that look scary. It's almost like God put scary guys in the land, sent the spies in to see the scary guys, to then come out and give a report about the scary guys, all to what? It's a test. Are you going to believe me? Are you going to trust me? If I put those guys in there on purpose, it's all, it's all meant to have us really examine. What, what, what is this all about? What do we really believe? Brethren, you know what? In the course of time, they actually had a rule in Israel. In Deuteronomy 20, the officer shall speak to the people and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. It's contagious. Do you recognize that because of the unbelief and the lack of courage, the cowardice of Ten men, a whole nation failed to get the victory. What do we say? 
I, we get people in the church sometimes they blush. It's it's like no, I can't go out. I can't go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came from glory and laid down His life and spilled His blood. I can't go out and share that in front of other people. What do we? People who blush for the God and the gospel. They have no stomach for the conflict with the enemies of our God, with confronting error, confronting unbelief, confronting the lost pagan nations, confronting the devil and his hordes, confronting sin. To those in our midst who count their own lives more dear than their king's cause, who prize this world above the next, never serious about grasping the, the promises of God. They shrink when devils and Anakim rise up and draw their swords against our master. What do we say to such people? Well, we say, courage, brother. Courage, sister. God Almighty does not want half-hearted, trembling service. Do you recognize our God is never at a disadvantage because of giants? Never, folks. Soldiers of Christ, arise. Find courage, man. Put your hand to the hilt of your sword. Trust that lion, don't we call him the lion of the tribe of Judah? He's our captain. He's at the head of our ranks. He stood toe-to-toe -to -toe against the true Goliath, and he defeated him again and again, and he's crushed his head. He goes at our head. We remain in the ranks. Don't be among those who make the, your fellows melt. God, help us to be lion-hearted. whole nation. They were well able. You know what? We know they were well able because 40 years later, they did it. They did it in the power of God. Caleb said, we're well able. The other said, no, we're not able. We, you know what the thing is? We abhor the idea of being identified with those 10 men. But I've witnessed more than one professing Christian unwittingly just discourage God's people. And you know what? This is just a general discouragement. This is a discouragement from advance, from moving forward, from going on. Brethren, may the living God give each of us courageous hearts, and especially in light of the fact that cowards don't ultimately inherit the kingdom of heaven. You ever read that in Revelation? Cowards find themselves in the lake of fire. Something even our hero. This is a story that I found online. It's Spurgeon about Mueller. I find this amazing. Spurgeon said this, Some gentleman, singular, said to me, I wish you would ask Mr. Mueller a question or two. If you see him as to the foundation of a new orphan house, which he proposes to build to hold 700 more children, now, I feel that 300 is quite enough for one man to care for. I think it very absurd for him to have 700 more. You see, those are the kind of voices. Oh, are they not too free? He'll never be able to support a 1,000. As to the present situation, I believe that generous persons hear about it and send him subscriptions for its maintenance. But as to supporting 700 more orphans, that's impossible. Spurgeon says that he replied to this man, I think there's something in what you say. I will ask him when I see him. But when I saw him, I could not, and I dare not, ask him any such question. When I saw what a great work he had done by his faith and began to remark upon it, he said, Oh, it is only a little thing that I have done. Faith could do far more than that. If it were God's will that I should feed the universe on prayer and faith, I could do it. If I had more faith, it could be accomplished. Spurgeon says, I was just going to say that possibly a thousand orphans would be more than he could support. When Mueller said, when I got 300 children, I began to pray God to send me money to build an orphan house to hold 700 more, and I've already received 17,000 pounds sent in for it. Although I've never solicited a contribution from anybody but the Lord, 
I believe God has made me to be here, to be to the world a proof that he hears and answers prayer. Spurgeon says, I thought so too when I saw the huge building and the many dear children rising up to praise their God. Brethren, advance. Think of our God. Brethren, I don't want to be a broken record. I, I just feel like I'm captivated and captured by the promise that the works that Christ did we're going to do and greater works than these we're going to do. The power of the church to be unleashed and to advance. The promises we have that we can pray for the Holy Spirit. We have a Father who is well desirous to grant that. Listen to this. Piper says, the whole class flunked their final exam of the wilderness training and they weren't allowed to graduate. All the children are sent back to school. If two and a half years of human helplessness and divine wonders doesn't put trust into the hearts of Israel, then we'll make it 40 years. Spurgeon, he's talking about advance, forward. He says, I would that this age would breed a few extravagant men. We're getting so dull, so cold, so commonplace. And this, uh, this statement just resonates. We all run in the same cart rut, imitating one another. In the sight of the heroes of old, we little men do walk under their huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. And all this is because we've left off faith. Let a man believe that God has called him to a mission. Let him say forward in God's name, and that man will tell upon his times and carve his name in the rock of ages and leave memorials behind him when angels shall gaze upon while the names of emperors and kings are swept into oblivion. Folks, the implication's clear. God's looking for those people who trust him. Don't lean on their own self. The whole thing is just designed to to lay bare our human helplessness. Brethren, we are grasshoppers, but we can be grasshoppers we are. We can be empowered by the God we have to be giant slayers. What are the giants that lay before us? Brethren, we need to think big. We need to pray big. Why? Because we have a big God. I mean, look around. What do you see? I, I, I ask myself this question. Is this all that Christ shed his blood for? Is this all that the mighty spirit that we that stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high and we see what happened to these people clothed in the power of the spirit and they're released into the land and they go out and among the Gentiles and all over and they turn the world upside down? Oh, brethren, reform men can get, we get to the place where you just, it's a kind of reform guy get through Sunday and listen to another good sermon. But brethren, we come together because we're supposed to be equipped for the work of ministry. Yes, we want the good sermons. All we want them. All, all we want is to see how big our God is. We want to see how big his Christ is, how big the cross is, what's been accomplished here. And there's the world set before us. Have we not been called to be a people to advance, a people to go forward, a people onward? Is this really the fullness of God's work? I mean, I, you know what, Ruby and I, quite honestly, in all the places I've traveled in the world, I have, I, I, I will say, not, it's not forced out of me by any measure. Your country is one of the most beautiful places that I've ever seen in my life. We've traveled the lakes. We've traveled the peaks. It, I mean, we've seen the mighty oceans off the shores. And it, it's impressive. But brother, in creation, we see that. What we don't want is when it comes to the church, it's kind of littleness. Little, little, little is what describes what we see. Oh, brethren, I hope you detest the idea of that. Oh, how is littleness just stamped? And you know what? Ruby and I went down there to Bristol and we saw Mueller's homes. And it's just like, whoa, what, a, what am I doing? I, what am I doing with my life? Where are we going? What are we doing? What are we accomplishing? Because it's all for God's glory. I mean, Mueller said, God can do this. I want to show the world. And you see the size of those orphan houses. And it just makes me feel like littleness is just stamped on everything that we're involved with, that we do. Oh, God. I mean, it just needs to be an unleashing. Spurgeon said this, I'm inclined to think that until we see some great 
and daring deed attempted, some great and marvelous thing done for Christ, we shall not see the glory of the Lord revealed, so that all flesh shall see it together. What are we doing here? All of us cooped up on this little island. All of us living in England. The world lieth in the wicked one. How is it our hearts beat not for the heathen? Brethren, has God not told us to go? What would we do if we but had faith? What would we do if we would had the hearts of Caleb and Joshua? We can take those giants. Oh, we live so much on things seen that we become paralyzed. Oh, church ledgers, bank accounts, they paralyze us. You say, young man, I, I desire for the old men. So often young men, God does new things to young people. You say, young warrior. God prompts you to dash out into the thick of the battle somewhere. I just say to you, remember the dead giants. We can say, where to you, Goliath, when God's in our camp? Do, you Do we believe it? Do we believe it? Only dare it. Have you ever found that, that God is not greater yet than our daring? That God who specifically told us that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we think, according to the power at work within us. It's not just he's talking there about God's general power. It's his power in us. That's, that's the whole point. It's him. It's working through us. Brethren, by faith, this power can be unleashed. God, you ever notice God loves to be trusted. Yes, yes, we can be like the king of old who said, you know what, our enemies are great. Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't have any strength. We're, we're, we're clueless here. Our eyes are set upon you. Have you ever noticed that when you get in that kind of situation, the victory is, is there, it's coming? We, what we don't want is a little hardship, a little difficulty, a little danger, and we just slink back into this ignoble sloth and slow death. Oh, that we would rise to the glory of believing, brethren, there is an advance, 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 even if you're older in years, even if your health is declining. Can we not take to an... Oh, I, I ask you, you that are older, you that feel like your health can't take you, brethren, become more the prayer warrior. Fight on your knees. Fight. Ask God to wake you up in the mid dead of night. Pray. Find out where the men are who are going forth, who are out there on the front lines, who are doing things like Mueller did. Find those people and pray. Oh, I, can, I cannot tell you how when through my life, Ruby's life, when we come across people that tell us. I mean, we, we had a brother over here in England, and he had our picture on his mantle. He said, we pray for you every day. That is so precious. That is more precious than gold and silver. And so whatever part we have to play, I'm saying a few more rolling stones at most, this race is over, folks. And we, we just, we don't want to waste our life. There are giants in the land and we don't want to be paralyzed by them because our God is big. We need to see what the world cannot see. Our God is big and his promises are big. The giants are big. But it all that is it's comparative. What are they to God who creates the universe with a word? They're his creations. He can squash them in a moment. He can give the skill of David's arm. I mean, you ever tried to sling a rock? If I was out there against that guy, I mean, I'd probably hit myself in, my, in the head. It's like zoom. being able to sling a rock and hit him. And But when God's with you, Advance, advance, advance. Our time is short. This is all for our instruction. God wants us to trust him. Amen.